because it's also the the desire to improve or to accelerate economic growth no has always been associated with uplifting the lives of people no? if there's this basic assumption that if the economy grows if your gdp gnp shows a positive growth no everyone is uh, no, no is everyone benefits no but as you were talking about development industrialization or deindustrialization then i, I also was reflecting on agriculture no is there like an environmental cost no that we are now paying for especially the poor no um the marginalized are they is there a cost in terms of the envir- of the environmental conditions no um in terms of climate change for example is this an issue that is related as well to economics um again let's be very um, a bit more specific to mm. make it more um, manageable rice farmers um rice farmers now are being squeezed on three fronts Mm-hmm. They're being squeezed on one front by climate change. Um, increase in temperatures actually affects mm-hmm. um, crop growth. It 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 lower it tends to lower productivity. So that's one pressure point lowering farmers um, tending to lower farmers' incomes because it um, it's like a force of gravity dragging mm-hmm. um, crop productivity down. They're also squeezed on a second front by expensive inputs mm-hmm. um, because over the decades of going towards high yielding varieties, you've had the soil bombarded with chemicals mm-hmm. um, you know fertilizers herbicides genetically so modified and, uh, generally rice. Mm. they've been sort of bombarded with chemicals again affecting their nutrient mm-hmm. um, capacity so that's why fertilizer is so important right now because the soil has been killed over decades mm-hmm. you need more fertilizers to produce the same amount of um, of, 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 of crops mm, of the rice, yield mm-hmm. the yield so you have two fronts now um, increase in temperatures affecting productivity you have decreasing soil fertility um, need, need to be compensated by expensive farm inputs so on the um, productivity side rice farmers are being squeezed mm-hmm. on the third front they're now being squeezed by cheap prices for the products because of cheap competition mm-hmm. from abroad so how are farmers affected right now because of a long-term lack of uh, government attention to climate change mm-hmm. because of an immediate problem of the government um, relying on chemical intensive um, farming mm-hmm. driving their um, farmers expenses up and then the rice liberalization law driving farmers incomes down mm-hmm. rice farmers on the losing end of all of that in the end they are, are bottom line they're earning less money now than they were before and again they're being driven off the land and they're not producing anymore with the two um, bad effects mentioned earlier as f- rice farmers as individuals as those Filipinos they're going to go bankrupt and in terms of the Philippine economy rice production is going to mm. be much lower now we're going to be much more dependent on imported rice in the coming decades than we have been in the past decades mm. that's an interesting point because you were mentioning on how um, climate change has contributed towards increasing poverty in the Philippines lowering opportunities no? and also I guess the more important question there is what is the government doing? Because you mentioned government neglect, neglect has been systematized. No, it's actually in, it's part of the institution itself. No, but are there actual measures being undertaken? Because you mentioned the agricultural sector, definitely. Um, I'm guessing there's also an impact to the fisher folk, to those who are, or in, in aquacultures, aqua aquaculture production. No, and I'm also guessing there is there an impact on the urban poor. No, so given all these things, no. Is there government? Is there an, an effort from the government? Because you're saying it impacts economy, it impacts growth, climate change. Is there are there any efforts by the government you not know, to mitigate and perhaps hopefully a long term plan towards addressing issues on climate change and the economy? Um, well, of course, the most obvious response to the hazards of climate change is when disasters can happen or calamities happen. So I think. Um, improving people's capacity to respond to an actual disaster that's something where the government has had quite a lot of difficulty um, um, dealing with so again I think your land is quite fresh in our minds um, the, the problematic response long-term response to Yolanda with a lot of um, affected families still not having enough livelihoods right now still being um, not having not be able to return to their homes especially in the coastal areas I think that's that's a whole cluster of issues but I sort of want to step back because from a long-term development perspective that notion that there is a problem with climate change has to be at the heart a lot of a lot for decision making um, 
to, again, to be very specific, if you take to heart that climate change is happening, if you take to heart that government decisions about policies affecting the power sector or the traffic mm-hmm. situation matter to climate change, then some difficult decisions will have to be made. Mm-hmm. In terms of power, for instance, if you accept that climate change is a problem, if you accept fossil fuels worse than climate change, mm-hmm. the government should stop relying on coal plants. Mm-hmm. But I think 70 to 75% of um, new power coming online in the next five to 10 years mm-hmm. is still coming from coal plants. So that's mm-hmm. a problem mm-hmm. there because that, that means mm-hmm. they're not taking to heart mm-hmm. climate change is a problem because they're actually going to be contributing to the problem by still being over reliant on, on fossil fuel um, mm-hmm. power. Traffic. It's so obvious. If there's one major source of pollution um, in, for instance, mm-hmm. Metro Manila, it's private vehicles. Mm-hmm. What's the solution to that? Two things. You improve the public transport system, but also you lessen the private vehicles on the road, mm. not the buses. Mm. You lessen <laughs> a car that mm. has like one or two people mm. riding in it. But what is the An oil doing? guzzling SUV. An yeah. oil guzzling SUV. Mm. But the government is not addressing the individualized private mass, privatized, um, private mass transport problem. Mm. So if you look at those two just those two examples, the fossil fuel dependent power and the traffic situation in Metro Manila, the government has made the policy choice. It is scared to aggravate the welfare of the rich. Mm-hmm. Why? Cheap coal is very profitable mm-hmm. for the energy firms. Mm-hmm. Energy firms want cheap coal. The companies buying energy from coal plants want the cheap power. The government has refused to step in and subsidize renewable energy mm-hmm. because it's too expensive for them and it's not profitable either for the um, private firm producing the coal who are going to make a quick buck in the next five years mm-hmm. or for the downstream energy consumers who will benefit from the cheap um, the cheap power. Mm-hmm. So the government there has taken the side of um, power producers mm-hmm. and the um, power consumers, the industrial power consumers to say, okay, forget about the mm-hmm. fossil um, fuel impact on ano, on climate change. Keep your profits. Let's do the the fossil fuel dependent power um, power path. In terms of mass transport, it's so straightforward. Limit the number of private cars on the road. Mm-hmm. But the government is so they're pussyfooting around all these wealthy SUV owners that mm-hmm. they're not actually doing anything to limit the number of private cars on the road because they don't want to antagonize again the wealthy owners of the cars. Of course, they're going to be middle class mm-hmm. affected, but that's, that's not their main interest. Mm-hmm. And again, that's a good, I think for me, a good example of how if you are going to be pussyfooting around the interests and profits of a few, mm-hmm. you will not be able to make the long-term difficult choices that will benefit the many. So I think that's you know two little sort of um, mm-hmm. bucket examples of a wrong policy attitude to development policy in the country. But are those, because you're mentioning uh, about, you were talking about the government addressing these issues, no? aren't, isn't the national budget a reflection of the government trying to address these issues? For example, I think um, there's there has been an increase in the budget for education. I think for a lot of the government uh, agencies handling education, there was an increase in their budget allocation. No, Isn't that a reflection of the government trying to address all these issues about poverty, unemployment, the environmental costs of development, no, or exploiting natural resources. No. Isn't the isn't the government budget showing that? No? Um, it's I think one sided to just look at the size of the education budget as an indicator of the priority being given. What's more important, the size of the budget vis-a-vis the needs. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it's true. Um, if you look at, well, actually debt servicing, mm-hmm. but if you look at the sectoral breakdown of the budget, education does take the biggest amount. Mm-hmm. But that's the government. We shouldn't celebrate the government doing what it's supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And we shouldn't measure the priority given to education just in terms of how much of the budget is going there. Mm-hmm. We should measure... Is the education budget enough for the needs of the student population? Mm-hmm. Um, to take the budget, for example, there's about 100,000 backlog of schools right now mm-hmm. um, in, 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 the, in public schools in the country. The government budget for 2020, I think, only provides for 8,000 schools. Mm-hmm. So you have a deficit of 98, mm-hmm. 92,000. Mm-hmm. So they'll give it a big number, 
this how much you spend on mm-hmm. education. Okay, so you're prioritizing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, time out. How much are needed? We need 100,000 schools. How much are you funding? Oh, just 8,000. That's the better measure of the priority being given to education. If you're not filling up the backlogs, if there's a chronic school backlog, classroom backlog, mm-hmm. teacher backlog, um, teaching materials backlog, that is your sign of how much priority the government is giving to education. And I think if you unpack not just the education budget, even the health budget, the housing mm-hmm. budget, you will see that beyond these seemingly impressive big numbers, mm-hmm. it is still grossly insufficient for the needs of the population. And again, it's a chicken and egg. They'll say, yeah, but we don't have enough money. And we would argue, you know why you don't have enough money? Mm-hmm. Because you're cutting taxes on the rich. Mm -hmm. You're cutting taxes on wealthy families who are paying less personal income tax, less estate tax, less donors tax. Now you want to cut the um, taxes paid by large corporations. 75% Mm -hmm. of corporate income taxes paid by large corporations. You want to cut that. It doesn't make sense. The government can't complain that it doesn't have resources Mm -hmm. if it's making the policy choice to liberate the rich and big corporations from paying higher taxes. And if anything, under the guise of competitiveness, lowering those taxes. Mm-hmm. So you know, there actually is a bizarre logic operating here. Mm-hmm. The government is unduly biased towards um, um, the wealthiest sectors of society mm-hmm. and just sort of, in a way, being a bit deceitful to the needs, um, to meeting the needs of the majority. Mm-hmm. That's an excellent point because now you're saying that there's a crisis ongoing because of that particular political choice to favor the rich over the poor. No? Are there like tangible, visible consequences of this notion that the rich should have should be entitled to more and the poor should have less? No, because at the, at present, no, if we're following this train of logic that you know uh, that the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. No, are aren't there consequences in terms of uh, you know like um, crime rates, drug abuse? No, isn't there a correlation between poverty and those um, factors that are impacting society today? You know, I think there are huge implications. Um, if we sort of want to profile Philippine society right now, it's hugely unequal. Yeah. Um, looking beyond these super low poverty lines that the government is setting, if the government yeah. you have 70 pesos a day, you're no longer poor. That's, that's too low. Um, if you look at income levels, half the of Filipino families, it's about 11 to 12 million Filipino families, they're trying to survive on 15,000 pesos or much less. The poorest families have nothing to 3,000 pesos a month. Mm-hmm. So half the Philippine um, population is struggling on family income of 15,000 pesos or less. On the other hand, you have maybe the richest two, two and a half um, mm-hmm. percent of the population with incomes reaching 15, 16, 17 million pesos a month. Mm-hmm. So it's a huge inequality, mm-hmm. huge concentration of wealth on the top, huge gaps in terms of incomes Mm -hmm. on the bottom. What does that create in terms of our our society? Well, if people are desperate, Mm -hmm. they will be driven to find their own means to to, to, to become wealthier. So Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the petty crime comes from people at the bottom not having enough. I mean, I think I I think it's an article of faith. People would not be criminals if they Mm -hmm. didn't have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do it on a bell curve. There may be some recidivists who really want the mm-hmm. adrenaline rush, but I think as a whole, I'm, I'm a believer that most people, especially petty criminals, they're driven to that out of desperation. Or perhaps you can assume that impoverished people, if they commit crimes, it's crimes of uh, they are crimes of necessity yeah, rather uh, than yeah. So, so they're mm-hmm. compelled by family circumstances, mm-hmm. you know, not having enough table uh, mm-hmm. enough food on the table, a sick family member. I, I, I'm kind of sure that mm-hmm. a lot of the petty crimes at the lowest mm-hmm. level are driven by. Exactly, they were driven by necessity. So how do you solve that? Of course, over the long term, I think a more stable society with more jobs, Mm -hmm. more decent incomes, proper social services, it will take away that compulsion, that social necessity to be driven to crime because, you know, because people are better off. So I think that's a direct, there's a direct correlation, I believe, between the overall level of economic development and the crime rate, especially at the petty at the petty crime level. Mm-hmm. Second problem, that concentration of wealth actually also creates the conditions for criminality at mm-hmm. those levels. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I think there's a tendency towards abuse of power. Mm-hmm. If we have untransparent governance, if we have um, too much discretion being given to a few people um, in, in, in key government mm-hmm. um, positions, I think the tendency is you'll be unleashing this 
unfortunate profit-driven motive or wealth-seeking mm-hmm. motive of a few. And if there are no institutional checks on that corruption, either transparency and accountability of, of government officials, regulation of profit-seeking of corporations, I think that sort of desire by a few who are in power to enrich themselves even more will be given um, much greater play. Mm-hmm. So again, I, I also believe that we have to sort out for a more stable economy, mm-hmm. not just the inequality, lift people up so there's no compulsion mm-hmm. for crimes of necessity, but also part of development, have institutions, political institutions and economic regulatory mechanisms to rein in, mm-hmm. which I think is a, a big corporate problem, crime. to rein in high-level corruption mm-hmm. and high-level corporate crime, which mm-hmm. is happening, I think, right now. I think you know there's so many stories about the biggest land grabbers in the country. It's not the poor who are land grabbers. Mm-hmm. It's the rich who are land grabbers. Why did they get away with it? Because there's an accommodating government official giving legitimacy to their land grabbing. So I think you know, we have to address that high-level criminality as well. Mm-hmm. Because I was thinking about the military spending and military budget, and I was also reflecting on... Because there's this assumption or there's this claim by the government that crime has been increasing, no? which is, I think, contradictory because they're saying there's development, then there should be lower crime. I was thinking about why, are, why is the government spending highly on military on its military budget because I think recently there, there has been an increase in the surveillance budget of the various institutions now and then you also have talk it's a very I think a very convoluted way of looking at it but you have an increase in the military budget and then you have talk the anti um, the anti-drugs campaign no, which has targeted I think mostly the poor no and then you have the crackdown on the leftists no on the people on dissent specifically, although the more common poster child for this would be the left. No, I was thinking, how is this all related to what you're saying about inequitable distribution of wealth, and the government refusing to address these issues? Because you're also you were also mentioning the government doesn't have budget. No, but wouldn't it be wouldn't it be prudent to transfer some of the govern of, of of the funding from ensuring peace and order and transferring it to development? No, or human development. Well, for me, you know, it's so easy to get sucked into the awfulness of the situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is so depressing. Um, so for me, it might be defense mechanism. I'd like to step back from what's specifically happening under the administration. Look at it in a longer um, continuum of social mm-hmm. development. Um, the way I get sanity out of that is, unfortunately, what's happening right now is we have an economy and a society and a polity that for decades has become more and more unequal. It's created deep poverty, it's aggravated and worsened inequality in the economy, including also capture of political institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been happening over the last four decades right now, ironically, since the return of democracy um, post-Marcos, the post-Marcos dictatorship. I think that worsening trend towards economic undemocracy and political undemocracy it's created conditions for people to complain. And that's why, I, uh, again, as I, I work in the nonprofit sector. We welcome any and all forms of resistance to poverty, inequality, and development. Because if the grassroots sectors, if people's organizations from the basic sectors aren't making noise, it won't fix itself. It's not as self regulation mm-hmm. means self regulation for the wealthy, for the powerful. So for us, the four decades of increasing poverty, inequality, and development has created the conditions for strengthening movements outside of government mm-hmm. to shatter that elite hold over, over society. Mm-hmm. So that gives me sanity to see what's happening now because it seems that what's happening with the administration, this upsurge of opposition to that unjust, mm-hmm. inequitable system, the system is fighting back. Mm-hmm. Specifically, the elite-dominated system is fighting back. Because the gov- the third administration is implementing even worse free market mm-hmm. policies. It even wants to change the Philippine Constitution to mm-hmm. completely um, shift mm-hmm. to um, a neoliberal um, mm-hmm. economic policy regime. So I think it's oppositional um, because there's such an upsurge of protest against mm-hmm. uh, um, injustice, inequity. The system wants to become even more mm-hmm. unjust and inequitable. The way to do that, you put down the forces for for change. And I think increasing budget for the military, increasing budget for the police, that's in a way, it's a fascist trend to suppress those opposed to change in the system. Of course, it's packaged as anti-crime, mm-hmm. peace in order. But the question is, peace for whom? Order for whom? Mm-hmm. I think in a long-term perspective, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a system 
creating a more peaceful and orderly um, society to preserve the wealth privileges of the rich, which is a long-term problem because that means preserving or even worsening injustice and inequity in Philippine society. So for us, it's such a huge challenge right now. Mm. Um, I think we have to look at that sort of long-term trajectory because it won't change overnight. Um, and if people expect that you will oppose it now, then changes overnight. It's a recipe for um, demoralization uh-huh. and despair. I think it's happening over the long term. Our change um, time frame should also be over the long term. Mm-hmm. We should invest now, I think, for that. Because that's a very interesting point because you were talking about how this is actually part of this. Um, it's not surprising. No, it's, not, um, it's not surprising that conditions have uh, been on a downtrend because that's how the system was designed in the first place. No? But the underlying question there is, if there is extreme poverty, if there is joblessness, if there is, uh, if we're in a crisis, so to speak, an economic crisis that has led to the impoverishment and even death of al- of countless Filipinos, no? how come Duterte is very popular among the poor and the marginalized? Because what the government is saying, recent surveys have actually shown that there is complete and utter faith no? in Duterte's policy, in the Duterte economics framework, no? in the Duterte policies of ensuring um, not just social order, but also um, industrial growth. No? Um, I, I think that to equate popularity with correctness is a, a mm-hmm. bit of a problem. Um, popularity is a subjective notion. Um, so I think just because, first, I'm not buying into the surveys entirely, but again, mm-hmm. for the sake of argument, if you believe the surveys, 80%, I think 75, 80% yeah. mm-hmm. support Duterte, um, that does not at all show mm-hmm. that Duterte is doing something correct. That mm-hmm. does not at all establish that the government economic policy is correct. At most, it will show 75 to 80% of people believe what the government is doing is correct. But I think that that's where the challenge is for us. Um, what do we use as a framework for assessing the administration? Do we go the ultra democratic way? It's about a popular. It's a popularity contest. What's popular is therefore correct. Mm-hmm. We disagree. Mm-hmm. For us, what is correct is an economy creating enough jobs, creating enough incomes for the majority, an economy where um, the poor don't have to worry about their health care, their schooling, up until tertiary level, or their housing. Mm-hmm. An economy where there is genuine peace in order in the community, not the peace of the grave, mm-hmm. but because there's solidarity, it's a harmonious community because people respect each other. And for us, on those three parameters of what we feel are, are important development um, metrics, the current administration is unfortunately continuing the trend of past administrations. Joblessness is getting worse, mm-hmm. even if it's disguised. Mm-hmm. Incomes are actually getting um, even more unequal, despite glorifying so many billionaires landing mm-hmm. in the Forbes list. I think of that's even a sign of further inequality. Really. Actually, that, oh, that's, yeah. that's, a be, that's actually a better take on that. That's not a good thing. That shows how, mm-hmm. where is that wealth coming from? Mm-hmm. Why, did it not, why did it not go to the majority instead? Mm-hmm. And again, we have to unpack the, the, the free tuition mm-hmm. that covers, that's a good step, but that only covers half the tertiary um, student population. Universal health care, it seems like it's good, but it's buying into a privatized, expensive, mm-hmm. private sector-driven um, health framework. And of course, peace and order, we completely disagree. We have to believe in the importance of um, people's mobilizations, mm-hmm. of democratic institutions, beyond what the government says is correct. The government wants sort of people to be like mindless lemmings following mm-hmm. authority. Mm-hmm. I think that's not a decent conception of democracy. And mm-hmm. even if 75 to 80% of people surveys say believe that mm. that might be because the government has such control over the um, public propaganda system mm-hmm. it has such a good spokesperson by Duterte who seems authentic mm-hmm. who comes across as you know my heart is for the poor despite um, mm-hmm. clear evidence to the contrary I think if anything if that 75 to 80% it's true it's more to the credit of the government's propaganda um, mm-hmm. disinformation machinery more than are really reflecting the government is on the right path. Mm. That's a good point no? because now you're talking about an alternative framework, no? Toward an alternative perspective towards development, what needs to be done. No? But if the government seems to have deficiencies in terms of addressing those frameworks, the natural burden, of course, the burden would now shift to society to address these particular issues. No? Pero nga, no? That's the problem. No? You have poverty, you have on the other you have on the other hand on one aspect poverty. You have on the other um, an increasing control of the government over 
media propaganda and then you also have a crackdown on dissent no what how would social movements in particular how would the people resp how could they adapt no, or address these particular challenges no? first I think it's important not to treat the government homogeneously. Mm -hmm. um, our, our group, even foundation, works very closely with a lot of levels of the government bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And if you say there are about maybe one, one and a half, at most mm -hmm. two million government um, employees and officials, we don't treat them homogeneously. Mm -hmm. Our problem is not the one and a half to two million government machinery. Our problem is maybe the few tens of thousands of elite thinking government officials. Isn't that the problem? Because they're not actually in power. They're the ones who uh, occupy. Well, of course, long discussion about how mm. how should, you know, um, have uh, liberal notion of democratic elections, how should mm. it operate? And it's not, that's not really <laughs> red, but A very messy discussion. Yeah, yeah. but first off, I, I want to sort of say outright, we don't believe the government as whole is the problem. Mm -hmm. We believe the overwhelming majority of government bureaucrats, um, employees are right-thinking, decent Filipinos. Mm -hmm. Our problem is those setting policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that we, we have to be clear on that. And that is actually what gives us confidence that within the government bureaucracy, most, I think, will just follow th what, the, what the institution mm -hmm. tells them. Because you're an employee, if you don't behave, you're thrown out of a job. So mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of, in a way, um, caught, held by the neck. So I think mm -hmm. they're not the problem. The problem is the few. Mm -hmm. Second pro Second point, we do believe in democracy coming from the ground and from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, if it comes from educating pe people more about what's happening, we have to address government propaganda. Mm -hmm. The train law, huge propaganda, 99% of Filipino households benefiting. That is wrong, but the government used their platforms to propagate that. They bought media outfits to propagate that. Mm -hmm. They were buying forum, public forum space to propagate that. So for us, Education is so important. Mm -hmm. So we think out of the 110 million Filipino population right now, huge change for social movements, combat government propaganda mm -hmm. with facts, and then get let people to start thinking that yeah, maybe things aren't the way the government is saying. Mm -hmm. Second step, we have to make our voices heard. We have to organize. And th that, that takes mm -hmm. time. And again, going back to the earlier discussion, in a way, it's a backhanded compliment to social movements that the government is cracking down. Because mm -hmm. if you're not a threat, they won't if respond. you're not <laughs> sort of shaking things up or being a sort of a, mm. um, a creating the opening uh -huh. for change, they just ignore you. So for us, I think it actually affirms we have gotten somewhere. Mm -hmm. Huge, We're facing huge difficulties. But it's affirmation. If you reach out to enough people, they will organize themselves. They will mobilize for what they believe in. We're being challenged right now by a you know very authoritarian regime. Let's just fight back. Let's just keep on pushing based on facts. Let's keep on pushing based on what we believe is correct. Let's keep on pushing despite being um, being attacked physically, being threatened, you know, um, and, 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 and trying to be put down. And our our faith is that beyond Duterte, Duterte is going to go away. Authoritarian regime, another one might mm. succeed Duterte, but one thing that will never go away people will want to improve their lives. And as long as people realize an elite-dominated economy and political system will not improve your life, that's a fact. As long as that's a fact, people will always rise up against that system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sanino. So again, uh, it's, as if, it's as if the message really here is that it one cannot really just rely on the system and the government to address these econo the, the consequences of economics or the economic policy. You know? There's also a substantial, shall we say, resp or there's a so sort of like a responsibility among its citizenry to actually address these issues. No? Thank you for challenging, challenging those very individualistic notions of, uh, no, no. I think you know, we're part of the system. Mm -hmm. So I think it's as simple as that. It's not just an enemy. Mm. There's a system that we're part of, mm. and we can change that because we're part of the system. And I think it's that sort of notion that we can do something we have to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. We should not believe that the market is everything. We have to succumb to that. Mm -hmm. We have to resist that. We cannot believe that what the government says is correct, peace and order. Mm -hmm. We have to resist that. And I think once we have that point of conversion that we can do something because we're part mm -hmm. of the system, I think that sets in motion a process. It won't be overnight, but it sets in motion a process that will have, I think, a happy ending mm, sometime <laughs> from now. Sometime from now. Yeah, because there's always this hope now that, you know, um, 
even through crisis, as long as people respond, and it's a long-term project, obviously, you know, even this rise of populism, it is a consequence of a historical process you know, about of, of how people eventually became, they felt disempowered because of their lack of political, social, uh, political economic power, you know, and then they're suddenly resorting you know, to, you know, they're grasping at straws, you know, because out of desperation. You know. I think it's a populist moment. Yeah. Um, I, I, I completely believe people, society as a whole, knows what's best for them. Um, I think this particular populist moment was um, wrong thinking, elite individuals mm-hmm. exploiting people's frustrations. But I think it's a moment because we will learn. Mm-hmm. Knowledge is cumulative. Mm-hmm. Knowledge is never going to go backward to the dark ages. I think mm-hmm. as long as we believe that knowledge is always cumulative, that we will always keep learning, we will learn to go beyond these populist moments, authoritarian regimes. We will build a better society. And hum- humanity will <laughs> is learning. Humanity will improve. Maybe not in your lifetime, maybe in my <laughs> lifetime. Thank you. So thank you very much. Sally. Very critical point. So perhaps um, we've already discussed it, but just to reiterate, now, do you have any final words regarding you know the state of the country? And of course, a call for perhaps for people to participate in activities, maybe Ibon's activities no, regarding these issues? No? Um, I think right now, Ibon, we're just a small NGO, but we're very, very fact-based. So I think I would exhort, especially um, people in the academe, the youth, let's hold on to our facts. Um, unfortunately, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it. Unfortunately, the government is telling us willingly untruths. They're lying. So I think our main responsibility right now Let's interrogate everything the government says. A lot of it is true. It's not completely untrue. But some key points of analysis and facts are actually untrue. So I would exhort people, keep asking. Don't take things for um, at face value. Ebon, we have our website, www.ebon.org. We have frequent forums. Um, engage us. If we're wrong, we will correct it. Mm. Because like I said, we believe knowledge is cumulative. As long as people know what's happening, they will act for the better. Um, so for us, it's just not right now, we're in a particular moment where it, it's a government of untruths. Let's just keep on challenging government untruths. Believe the true things they say, question the untruths they say. Thank you very much, Sunny. No? So just to conclude, no, um, there's this popular saying, no, seek truth from facts. No? And inevitably, no, we will always be confronted with information that needs to be um, unpacked, analyzed, and then later on, even after this process, it needs to be further questioned. Economic data and even perceptions on poverty, they need to be challenged because otherwise, no, society will be unable to move forward if we keep accepting um, manufactured and unchallenged perceptions and information. So thank you very much for watching this session of the Public Intellectual Lecture Series. I am Leo for the, from the Interdisciplinary Studies Department. Good day.